Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so um, so we left off. Uh, do you have any questions before I start? No. Okay, so we left off talking about the final lipids and I showed you guys that that steroids are uh, all based all uh, steroids in uh, humans and then generally in plants are all based off of cholesterol so without cholesterol you wouldn't be able to synthesize the steroids that your body needs and when you guys take if you take anatomy and physiology the physiology part will cover these steroids specifically I'm just going to give you a few examples so um, you're probably familiar with cholesterol, even though this is not the same cholesterol that you hear that's bad for you on TV, uh, and that you take, you know, statins, which are cholesterol lowering drugs for, um, that is a, a lipoprotein. And so the name tells you that it's a lipid attached to a protein. Which is high density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein. And this is what they're talking about uh, for heart disease. And we talked about that there's really no correlation between this level and heart disease, but there is a correlation between uh, the ratio of these two because this has an antioxidant property uh, that will help protect you from oxidative stress that causes these um, macrophages. So what happens is that you have these things called monocytes in your blood and they roll around, they're circular shaped. And that's good because you want circular shape to roll around in your blood vessels. That's why like sickle cell anemia patients have a hard time uh, with, with blood clotting and things like that because these sickle shape will hang into the blood vessel and and cause it to clog up so this so let's say that your blood is flowing in this direction these things roll around um, and if you get an inflammation in your arteries so this is smooth muscle here then it it tell it your body says okay that there's something going on maybe i have an infection or something and it will make these sort of I'm just going to call them Velcro pads, which, you know, imagine if you're rolling a, a Velcro ball on a Velcro pad, it's going to slow it down. And then those, those monocytes turn into what we call macrophages, which are kind of like amoebas. They kind of ooze around and they can ooze in between the cells of the smooth muscle and they get in here and then they start uh, taking in this LDL because it, it's, because it's low density, it can get through the smooth muscle better than HDL, which can't really get through. And so these things will engorge themselves and then cause your artery to clog up like this. And so that once it, it restricts that blood vessel, usually in your heart, uh, then um, your heart can't get blood flow and it'll cause a heart attack. Uh, but it's not the this per se because you need cholesterol um, 
it's the inflammation. And so HDL will reduce this effect, which reduces inflammation, which will prevent that. But there are other things besides HDL that can do that too, like, like uh, vitamin E is an antioxidant. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. Uh, there's lots of different antioxidants. We're going to talk, there's one that has become quite popular. It's called uh, coenzyme Q or Q10. This is actually part of how you produce energy. Um, and we'll talk about this in chapter nine. But they, if you go to you know any drugstore or Walmart or Sam's Club or whatever, they sell this as an antioxidant. And that will also prevent uh, this first step of cardiovascular disease. So cholesterol doesn't cause that. Um, when I was at the VA, we looked at um, a compound called 7-keto cholesterol. Uh, and this does cause cardiovascular inflammation. And this HDL antioxidants can't re uh, reverse that. Um, this itself is caused by antioxidants. But what I want to point out is this numbering system. So remember, what functional group is this? Remember, these are carbons. Anybody tell me? Is it carboxyl? It's a carbonyl. Carbonyl. And specifically, it's a ketone, right? Because it's it has the carbon with the double bond in the middle, not on the end. If it was on the end, it would be an aldehyde. So this is cholesterol with a ketone group. On, what do you, what does the seven mean? That's where they're linked. So this is chapter four. It means it's on the number seven carbon, right? That's how we do our numbering system. So that's why this is called seven keto cholesterol. And you're familiar with testosterone, right? That's maleness and then estrogen or estradiol. So these are just some examples of things that you wouldn't be able to make if you didn't have sufficient cholesterol. And we all know that these things are important uh, for reproduction, which we said is important to life when we define that in chapter one. It's kind of interesting uh, because uh, there's fish that can change their sex based on exposure to either estrogen or testosterone. And so these particular fish uh, have been increasing the level of uh, female fish. Uh, and that's in Arizona, uh, as well as around the country. And so lots of these fish that are susceptible to estrogen are becoming female. They're switching from male to female. Do you guys have any idea why? So it's actually from birth control. So uh, this is not water soluble, right? Remember we said all lipids are not water soluble. So when you take uh, birth control, excess amounts of birth control are excreted in urine. That ends up in the water supply. And because this isn't water soluble, it's really hard to remove. So then that water supply gets emptied into rivers and lakes, which cause the fish to increase their exposure to estrogen. And uh, just so you know, the levels of estrogen have been steadily increasing in the, the city of Phoenix municipal water supply as well. Okay, any questions about the, the fats that we just covered? So remember we have the three different kinds of fats. We have the triglycerides or triacylglycerols. And then, you know, we have uh, saturated and unsaturated. Make sure you know the difference between the two. So what makes it unsaturated?
It has less. Um, the hydrogen. Less hydrogens, right? And to do that, we can add a double bond, and that reduces the number of hydrogens. So saturated has single bonds, unsaturated has double bonds, and then we can have mono unsaturated. And what does that mean? It's one linkage. It has one double bond, right? And then we have poly, and that has more than one double bond. All right. <clears throat> and then we did the phospholipids. And by the way, what are the monomers for triglycerides? Make sure you know this for the test. It was on your uh, your um, chemistry worksheet, and you guys filled out the table for that. So this is glycerol and three fatty acids. Those are the monomers. Okay, well, phospholipids, what are the mo monomers for phospholipids? They have two fatty acids. And one this is actually called phosphatidylcholine, but as long as you know it's a phosphate group, it's fine. So the fatty acids are these uh, hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Are they hydrophobic? Yes. So they, they turn away from water. And then this phosphate group that's on there, is that hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophilic. Right. So this is water loving. So this is always going to turn towards water. And that's always going to turn away from water. And then the last lipid is what? So the last fat. It's cholesterol and the steroid hormones. So there are protein hormones, and we have to distinguish the proteins from the steroid hormones. All right, so make sure you guys know all that stuff for the exam. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are the proteins. And from your chemistry lab, you guys should know that proteins are composed of amino acids. And most of you guys wrote in the very last question, you know, where it said, what are proteins? You, most of you said that they're made up of 20 different amino acids, and that's right. So proteins monomers are amino acids. And that makes a polymer. So amino acid monomers are linked together. How do we join amino acids together? What's the reaction called? So make sure you guys know this for the test. Dehydration joins molecules. And what's the one to break them apart? If you ate a protein bar, what would break it apart? Hydrolysis. So make note cards. This is these are super important reactions for life. And um, you know, this is a general biology class, so you need to know this for sure. Life wouldn't exist without this. All right. So remember when we link glucose or sugar molecules together, we called them glycosidic linkages. Well, we call these peptide bonds or the links between amino acids. And uh, so we could just do amino 
carboxylic acid. So these are two amino acids, and then the reaction would be to take the water out, which you guys showed me, and then form that linkage. And that linkage between those amino acids is called a peptide bond. All right. So proteins are the most complex molecules known to exist to man. And the reason is, is because we can, we have all these different functional groups and we have the carbon that can make four bonds. So these functional groups can have different properties. They could be positive, they could be negative, they could be acidic, they could be basic, they could be hydrophobic. They can be hydrophilic. So the these functional groups can in proteins can make super complex structures that can do super complex reactions. All right. Um, any questions about that? No. Okay. So just to let you know some of the functions of proteins, they help uh, support us like keratin, uh, a lot of your like uh, anti-aging creams and stuff are gonna have like structural support, things like collagen, keratin, all of those are made out of proteins. Um, you know, that's a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, we can store amino acids, uh, in albumin, which is very similar to egg whites, you have this circulating in your blood right now. Um, you can use it to transport things like hemoglobin transports our oxygen to our cells so that we can live. Uh, we can use it for signaling like insulin. So insulin uh, signals uh, cells to open their channels for uh, blood sugar, usually glucose. And when we get to chapter eight, we'll talk about how this works. Um, the receptors uh, on your cells and even like the receptors in your eyes are made out of proteins. So you wouldn't be able to see or see colors without proteins. Proteins allow you to move. Myosin is a protein that's a motor protein that allows you to contract and relax your muscles. Um, your immune spots response your antibodies that are proteins they're generated as a response to a foreign invader and sometimes this response is to things that aren't foreign invaders like dog hair or cat hair and that causes allergic reactions and then uh, enzymes which a lot of you guys talked about uh, enzymes uh, to break down stuff but in your in your saliva you have an enzyme called amyl, amyl lace, and that breaks down amylose, which is, uh, you guys know from earlier in this chapter, it's the sugar long chain of glucose molecules. Is it branched or straight? Straight. It is. And is this what's the bonds between these glucoses and amylose? Is it alpha 1 4, alpha 1 6, or beta 1 4? Alpha 1 4. Yep. Good. So you need to know that for the test. And so this enzyme, it does, enzymes only speed up reactions. That's why they're called a catalyst. So enzymes are proteins, they speed up the reaction by having groups and we talked a little bit about this right so if we want if you want to digest uh starch so here's a little lesson what do all sugars end in ose O's. right so do carbohydrates end in ose The answer is no. 
the starch in an OSE? No. No. So that's not a real term for starch or carbohydrates. The actual scientific term is amylose. I don't know how uh, starch or carbs got into the mainstream or whatever. People just must not like saying this word, but it has to end in OSE if it's a sugar uh, scientifically. So amylose is the actual name for starch uh, or carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. So anyway, um, so if we if if amylase is a protein, what would it jo its job be in order to break down amylose? How do we break down amylose? What's the reaction? Hydrolysis. Yes. That's exactly right. And so amylase is not going to become part of this uh, molecule. It, it's, it doesn't do anything. It's just a, it's a worker, like enzymes are workers. So its job is to add water to somehow get water to go to amylose. And so the way it does it is it has a specific shape that binds water and a specific shape that binds the sugar. And when it brings the sugar bond, and when it brings these two together, water reacts and splits that bond. So in order to do that, it has to have, uh, do you think it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophilic. Right. If it was hydrophobic, it would scare water away and this reaction would never occur. So that's why these chemical properties of proteins uh, are important. And we're gonna go into this in chapter eight in detail. Uh, but right now, I'm just kind of hitting on what the purpose of that is. Okay, so I've been drawing this out and you guys saw this in your chemistry thing. So when we talk about proteins, they always have a central carbon. So they're always gonna have a carbon. They're always gonna have an amino group. That's where they get their name. And they're always gonna have a carboxylic group that's directly across from it. And they always have a hydrogen. So these are the three groups that are found in every single, uh, uh, all 20 amino acids. This group here is the variable group. So there's 20 different ones, 20 different R groups, and they can, they, it could be hydroxyl, it could be phosph, uh, there's no phosphate, it could be sulfhydryl, um, it could be uh, a hydrocarbon like methane or whatever. So it can have, it could, this could be negative. Uh, it could have um, another amine group on it. So it could be positively charged. Um, so there, there's all kinds of different R groups, 20 different ones. You don't need to know this. If you took biochemistry, you'd have to memorize these. But uh, for this class, you don't need to know that. But what I want you to know is the basic structure of, the, of this. And so I'm just going to erase this real quick. I'm just giving these examples. You don't, need to, you don't need to memorize the R groups. You don't need to know the R groups. You just need to know where the R group is. So on the test, you would need to be able to sort of draw this out. So it's pretty easy. You just need a carbon, amino, carboxyl, and hydrogen. So if you know, you know these from chapter four and from your chem lab, um, then you should be fine. And then the, the fourth group, remember carbon can make four bonds and it has to, is the R group or variable group. So this one varies. This is called the backbone, the things that are the same, which are these groups here. This is the backbone. It never changes, right? It's the same for every amino acid. And this is what we call the variable group. So every uh, protein has a backbone that not, never changes. 
and then it has a variable group that uh, is going to be put in there based on the the code in the DNA. And we'll talk about how that's done when we get to chapter 17. So that'll be the final chapter. All right, any questions about that? So amino acids, remember they're the monomers of proteins. So we link amino acids together. We To do that, we have to take water out, right? If you're gonna break them down, like if you're digesting proteins into amino acids, um, then, then you need hydrolysis. Remember, it's a central carbon. We call that an alpha carbon. I don't care that you know that. And all of these are covalent bonds, which means they're sharing electrons. Has this, this is always present. This is always present. This is always present. And this makes up the backbone. And then this is the 20 different variable groups here. So that's what you need to know about uh, the monomers of proteins. And just practice drawing this out. You know, after a while, it's super easy. It's just, you just need to know the functional groups, just amino and carboxylic acid. That's where it gets its name, amino acid. And it doesn't matter um, the way it's drawn? No, so like on the test, you know, I might ask you, you know, what what is this? And you could just tell me it's an amino acid. Okay. So this is what I was talking about. You don't need to know all these side chains. It's, that's for, that's for uh, bio, a biochemistry class. But this figure is showing you that, remember, in order to make these bonds, we have to remove water. And what's that called? Dehydration. Yes. I'm gonna make you guys eventually know this. Uh, what's the purpose of the self hydro group? What does that do for a protein? It allows it to help maintain its shape, right? Because like if you were drinking hot coffee with sugar in it, you wouldn't be able to break down the sugar because the shape of the protein would change. Because temperature, remember two, this temperature and pH are the mortal enemies of proteins. They can change its shape and cause it not to work. Just like a car part. If I change the shape of a car part, it wouldn't no longer function. So these are the side chains, right? And then this is the backbone. So it's an amino and a carboxyl and an amino and a carboxyl and an amino and a carboxyl. And then it has these hydrogens too. So it's all, this backbone is just a repeating same, 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 same. The only thing that varies are these side chains or these R groups. That's an R group, that's an R group, that's an R group. And remember this, this link here is called a peptide bond. If this was in a sugar, what would it be called? Glycosidic. So glyco means sweet. Okay. I've already drawn that out, so I'm not going to bother with that video. Okay. So, so in the end, what's important is shape, right? Shape is the most important thing in biology. So. When these proteins are made, they're gonna end up having a specific shape. We call that the protein conformation, which really literally means the shape, right? The 3D shape of the protein. What determines this is the order of the amino acids. Um, so imagine this, let's say that we have this, I'm not gonna draw the whole thing up, but let's say we have this amino group and this carboxyl group, and it's gonna to link to the next one Okay, so these, this is one amino acid and this is another amino acid. 
Okay, so that's our backbone. Now we have an R group. So let's say that R group is positively charged. And this R group is also positively charged. What's going to happen to this protein? What will happen to this, this bond? Will it bend up or down? Bend down? Yeah, it's going to bend down. So it would end up having this sort of shape, right? Because two positives repel each other. So that's what would happen there. Now, what if I change this from a positive to a negative? It would bend up. Then it would bend up, right? So you could imagine that we could get all kinds of crazy shapes just from varying the charges, right? So this might be a negative and a positive pulling the protein chain together. This might be a positive pushing it apart. So you could get these really complicated shapes uh, from the variables in the, these R groups. So the sequence of amino acids de determines the shape of this protein, right? If two positives were there, it would bend down. If there were two negatives, it would bend up. And you, know, you can have proteins that are hundreds or thousands of amino acids long. And so you could imagine that you can make these really complex structures. So when scientists draw, draw these out, we draw them two ways. So this is called a ribbon diagram. And this is a protein. So, so we're not showing all the amino acids here, but, we, but I, from looking at this, I can see some things. First, I can see that these are yellow. And what element uh, is yellow? Do you guys know? It's sulfur. So these are sulfhydryl bonds, and these are the bonds that are giving this protein its strength and its shape. And there's quite a few in here. So I would imagine this protein is probably not found inside the cell. It's probably uh, in your mouth or you know in your tears or something like that, maybe on your skin. Uh, because it, it, it has all these sulfhydryl bonds to keep its shape uh, in, the, in different temperatures and pHs. And then I can also see that this right here has this spinning structure on it. And we call that, we call this an alpha helix. And this one has a flat structure like that. And we call these beta or that's a terrible beta. It's like this. So alpha helixes or beta sheets. And so this ribbon diagram actually lets me see um, where these helixes are and where these sheets are. This is what we call the space filling model. And I can't see the alpha helices and beta sheets or the sulfur bonds, well, maybe a little bit here. But I can't see this hidden one over here because it's in, embedded inside the protein. But this is where the actual atoms and electrons, so that like each of these is a cloud, an electron cloud that we talked about in chapter two. And so this tells me what the actual shape of this thing is. And I could, you guys can see hopefully right here, there's a pocket, like an indent. And this is probably where something would bind. So it could be uh, a drug or a receptor on a cell. You know, uh, maybe it's an insulin receptor or something like that. And so I could predict where uh, other compounds would bind to it from this three-dimensional shape. But regardless, these are, are formed by folding and coiling of these uh, protein chains um, from the different properties of the amino acids, like we talked about, positive or negative, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. They could have different pHs. Um, and so that shape really dictates its function. So just to give you an example of this, this is the enzyme that copies your DNA. 
this, this white thing right here. And this is called DNA polymerase. It ends in ASC, so it's an enzyme. And the pol polymer tells you it's building polymers from monomers with the monomers that make up DNA, which are what we call nucleotides. And we'll get to that in just a second. So the shape of this has to specifically fit on this DNA in order to copy it. If you couldn't copy your DNA, let's say if you, you started from a single fertilized egg and you had to divide that into a, a roughly a trillion cells before you were born. So there, that's a lot of division. And every time you divide, you have to copy your DNA. Well, what if this enzyme didn't work? What if it didn't have that right shape? Then it wouldn't fit. You never, right, it wouldn't fit and it wouldn't work and you never get past the single egg stage. So you would end up being a miscarriage because of the shape of this protein, right? Or we can also change the shape by two other ways. What, would ha what happens if we heated you up? It could change the shape. Right. So if you had a high fever, right, it could change the shape of your protein and that could cause you to die for lots of reasons. Maybe you couldn't copy your DNA. Maybe your hemoglobin can't carry oxygen. What's the other way that you could, we could change the shape of this? pH. Yeah. And later on, when we get to chapter 17, we exploit these uh, properties in order to be able to copy DNA in a test tube outside the body. And this allows us to figure out who the baby's daddy is or who left their blood at the crime scene or basically anything that we do with DNA and, and even making you know, those vaccines uh, for COVID. So uh, this is a really important thing to remember uh, because it's, it's, it helps us to uh, utilize what we know about DNA uh, to figure out things like we just talked about. So anyway, the point of this slide is to sh show you how important shape is in biology um, and that what things can do to change that shape so it will no longer function. All right, so there's four different levels of organization in proteins. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Uh, the quaternary structure uh, is when two or more subunits of proteins come together to make a functional protein. You can kind of think of it as a bicycle, right? So if you just had a bicycle wheel, would that be a bicycle? No. No, you need the, you need the frame and the seat. This is a terrible bicycle, by the way. But, um, you know, and the chain and the sprockets and all that other, and the pedals. And so if something's a complicated protein, it might need more than one part. Uh, you know, you, a bicycle is much more complicated than a unicycle, right? And so quaternary structure arises when you have complex proteins that need to come together like different parts in order to make it function. And remember that uh, genes, the DNA, sections of DNA, give these instructions for the exact order of these amino acids. So if you know, if you had leucine and alanine and glycine uh, in that order, you could think of it as like these are letters in the English alphabet. So let's just say that this spelled rat, right? Well, if you rearrange the same letters, those are two different things, right? This is a furry rodent mammal. This is a substance from trees. They have, they, these things are. Uh, if you think about them, they're two different objects. Like if I said, imagine a rat or imagine tar, you would think of two different things. And it's the same thing that your body does. So the order of these 
uh, amino acids are super important to instruct uh, your cells what to make, whether it's hemoglobin or collagen or uh, any other kind of insulin, any other kind of protein. Okay, so the primary structure uh, is the linear sequence of amino acids, right? Remember, this is determined by genes. So I know that this is kind of hard to see, but this is a number one, and this is a number five, and a 10, and a 15. So we number proteins just like if I uh, if I wrote this out and I told you to read it from left to right, that would be red. If I told you to read it from right to left, that would be so the the direction that these are red are really important to making the right protein. We always, the cell always reads it from the amino to the carboxyl end. And every amino acid chain is gonna be linked together like that. If we go back to this, you'll see that it always is gonna have an amino end and a carboxyl end. And no matter how long it is, right? If we link this together, it's still gonna have a carboxyl end and an amino end. And we could make this a million long and it's still gonna have one end is gonna be an amino group and the other end is gonna be a carboxyl group. So we always number from this side, amino side to this side, the carboxyl side, so that we re read it right. Okay. We can uh, sequence this in order to figure out the order of the amino acids. So we can figure out what, like if we wanted to know what the order of amino acids in hemoglobin was. There's tricks, and we'll talk about this in chapter 17, in order to figure that out. Um, and, and that's kind of important because if we wanted to take uh, if we wanted to make, like, say, human insulin, well, we would need to know what amino acid sequence makes human insulin. And then we, once we design that, we could figure out what the DNA is that would code for the protein to make human insulin, and we could put it in a bacteria, and we could have the bacteria make human insulin, which they do. And so diabetics take uh, manufactured human insulin from bacteria and then inject that in order to manage their uh, blood sugar levels. So another thing that I wanna point out here is that very small changes in the order of these amino acids can cause big changes and what we see and the effects. So sickle cell anemia is a great example of this. Um, in humans, there's only one change that wouldn't kill you. And it's this change right here. So this is the order of hemoglobin. You don't need to know these, but this is valine and histidine and leucine and threonine and proline. And if you took biochemistry, you, you wouldn't remember this probably. And then it's glutamine and glutamine. So this is the order, you know, it's, it's, it's much longer than this, but it's just showing you the first few amino acids in that. That's what this dot, dot, dot is. Here, there's a mutation in the DNA that causes the amino acid to be coded for valine instead of uh, glutamine. And it's this valine that, it's actually the charge on this valine that causes the hemoglobin to change its shape. And these cells uh, can't hold their shape um, and it causes them to collapse into a sickle shape and that causes all kinds of problems. Sickle cells can get 
uh, caught into the artery walls and cause blood clotting and uh, they can't carry oxygen. So it causes anemia and there's all kinds of bad side effects for that. Secondary structures formed by uh, regular intervals of hydrogen bonds. And you guys learned about those, right? So those are bonds that are caused by oxygen and hydrogen not sharing equally or nitrogen and hydrogen not sharing equally. So the electrons stay around these very electronegative elements longer and these end up having negative charges and these end up having pot, so they're partial negative because to have a full negative, you have to transfer a whole electron. So here we have nitrogen and hydrogen. When you see that, you can tell that this is gonna have a partial plus charge and uh, this one, carbon and oxygen, they don't share very well either. And so this oxygen and this hydrogen will be attracted to each other and form a hydrogen bond. Each one of these dots symbolizes a hydrogen bond. So secondary structure, and this is really important, secondary structure is formed by hydrogen bonds. Hang on a second. Okay, secondary structure is formed by hydrogen bonds. Uh, and that causes what we what I showed you before in the ribbon diagram. So these are called beta sheets. And these are called alpha helices. And both of these structures are formed by the hydrogen bonds in the backbone, right? So not the R group only the backbone. And remember the backbone consists of the amino and the carboxyl and the hydrogen. So it's hydrogen bonds in these that cause these beta sheets or alpha helices. And this is the ribbon diagram. So we, this is the same one that I showed you earlier. So we can see that's an alpha helix, that's a beta sheet. All right. Um, do you guys have any questions about that? Okay, so primary structure is just the single order of the amino acids, you know, from number one all the way to the very end. It always goes from amino uh, to carboxyl. Secondary structure is formed by hydrogen bonds that are formed in the alpha helices or beta sheets. These are the exact same number of amino acids. But this has a lot more, beta sheets have a lot more. So this is two, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 16 hydrogen bonds. And this one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So which of these do you think hold their shape better? Beta sheets or alpha helices? Beta sheets. Yeah, the beta sheets because they have more hydrogen bonds. They're holding hands more. And there's things like spider silk that's almost made exclusively out of beta sheets. And because of those beta sheets um, and those H bonds, right? Spider silk actually has more tensile strength than steel. Um, and so you, we can use spider silk for a lot of, of crazy things like uh, uh, they can use it for Kevlar uh, as a replacement to Kevlar. It's actually stronger than Kevlar. Uh, so bulletproof vest, they can use it to line armor vehicles. But you know, one of the more exciting things I think that they could use it for is a space elevator. So you have the Earth. By the way, the Earth is not flat; it is round. And the so you could tether a cord up to a satellite that spins at the same rate as the Earth rotates. Uh, so this would have to be, you know, several miles long. And if you made it out of steel, it would be way too heavy, and this wouldn't work at all. But if you made it out of spider silk, you could actually get an elevator and run it up several miles of spider silk 
to outer space. And I know that you might think that this is far fetched, but there are actually plans and works to make a space elevator out of spider silk. The problem with this is that you can't, spiders are not social creatures. So spiders aren't going to just make a web for you uh, because you asked them. And so uh, what scientists have done in order to get enough spider silk to build something like this is they've, they've created So they've created goats that have uh, spider genes for silk that are found in their milk. And you, if you guys want to watch the video, you can watch this. It's quite interesting. Um, but these are found in Utah, right? Um, and they produce large quantities of spider silk from their milk. The, they claim the milk tastes exactly the same, that you, the only difference between it is that one has spider silk. And then they spin it in a centrifuge and they can spin out spider silk so they can use it to do outlandish things like make a space elevator. Do you guys have any questions about that? Everybody's still there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're just kind of digesting how bizarre that is? Yeah, yeah I've never heard of that before. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the beauty of, of the universal code of genetics. All animals have the same code. So you could take a gene from a spider and put it in a goat. And in fact, uh, now they're taking genes from salmon and they're putting it in strawberries. And the reason is, is that this is frost resistant because they live you know, in cold climates. And so that gene that makes them frost resistant, they put in strawberries. So now the strawberries are frost resistant. So next time you eat a strawberry, it might just have salmon genes in it. All right, so the tertiary structure is the, the, the structure that is determined by the R groups. So remember we have the primary and that's the sequence of amino acids, just the order you know, A, B, C, and so on. Secondary is, is the alpha helix and beta sheet uh, that is formed from the backbone. And what specific bonds form that? Hydrogen. Yes. And that's the only thing that causes secondary structure. And then the third one is tertiary, which is just the third structure, right? Uh, and using the scientific lingo. And this is caused by interaction of the R group. So remember, I just drew that before. You could have two positives next to each other. Uh, so that would cause them to bend. You could have uh, hydrophobic interactions that this might be important if you want to scare water away, which would be something about, uh, you know, uh, instead of breaking molecules, that might be dehydration. You know, you can have sulf sulfur interactions, you could have hydrogen bonds, uh, ionic bonds. So like we talked about negative R group and a positive R group. Uh, so all these different things can be found in tertiary structure because remember the R groups have different properties. They could be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. They could be uh, positive or negative. They could have, be acidic or basic. So you can make these microenvironments that are maybe acidic where you need to have a, a low pH reaction or something that's basic where you would want a higher pH reaction or you know something you want to scare water out of or bring water to or you know use positive and negative charges to change the shape or attract other negative or positive molecules so the it, so in tertiary it's the R group interactions and secondary it's the 
backbone hydrogen inter hydrogen bond interactions. <laughs> so we're getting a little more complicated here. And then the last one is quartinary structure. So in the beginning, I told you that this is where you have two or more, two or more proteins that have to come together to make a functional protein. And so hemoglobin is like that. So you might think when people say hemoglobin, you might think, well, that's just one molecule, right? Like a bicycle tire, but it's really not. Hemoglobin is made up of four subunits, two beta subunits and two alpha subunits. And these are different genes and they're located in different places in your DNA. So if this one stopped working, you wouldn't be able to make functional hemoglobin. If this one worked and this one stopped working, you wouldn't make, be able to make hemoglobin. And just to remind you, hemoglobin is what carries oxygen to your cells. And so if you don't think hemoglobin is important, just hold your breath and it will stop working. It's the same effect. And there are other things, collagen that gives your skin elasticity. Uh, it's formed by three groups that are actually intertwined, kind of like a braided rope. So that makes it stronger than if it, it wouldn't function right if there was only one subunit. So when collagen has three, hemoglobin has four subunits to make it functional. And because there's more than one, then it has a quaternary structure. There are some proteins that do not have a quaternary structure because they only need one amino acid chain to function correctly. All right, so this is just a review. We have primary uh, and, and then we have secondary and that's alpha helixes and beta sheets. Remember, these are made by the, the backbone and the hydrogen bonds, which are stronger, beta sheets or alpha helices. <clears throat> beta sheets, right? That's why I went into that whole spider spiel. Um, and then uh, this is the tertiary structure. This is a three-dimensional structure. What's that formed by? Interaction of the R groups. And then quaternary structure, that's when two or more of these proteins, so it's just showing you this is one subunit, right? This is one. But this particular protein looks like it has at least three. So that would be a, you, know, you would need three of these to make this. And that's quaternary structure. Any questions about that? Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about is the nucleic acids. So this is DNA and RNA. And they're very similar. So if you know one, it's real easy to know the other. Um, the protein st structure that we talked about is, is determined by the primary structure, which is determined by the DNA, the order of the A's and the G's and the C's and the T's. And again, we'll learn more about this in chapter 17. But we these this DNA, right? So the DNA, if we draw a cell, the DNA is in the nucleus. And there's only one copy of your DNA. So it's your cookbook, it's your instruction book. And so the order of these letters are going to tell this to make RNA, which comes out of the cell and that makes protein. Sort of think about it as you own the only copy of the Mona Lisa, you're not going to loan it out to your friends. So, but you wouldn't be, you'd be okay to go to the gift shop, buy them a copy of it and hand it out. And so that's what RNA's job is. It's to be a middleman, a messenger to make proteins. But the DNA is a permanent thing, right? If you permanently screwed up the Mona Lisa, all the copies after that would also be screwed up. So um, DNA is super important. And, and the areas that code for proteins are called genes. There's two main types of, of these nucleic acids. We have DNA, which stands for deoxy, and RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. So this is deoxy ribonucleic acid. This is ribonucleic acid. So what does D mean? If I de-pants you, what am I doing? Taking it away. Right. 
So D means take away and oxy, what do you think that's short for? Oxygen. Yeah. So if we look at these molecules, remember we number these things, one, two, three, four, five. So right here on this number two carbon in DNA, they're different. Everything else is exactly the same. Do you guys see that? So what's missing in DNA? The oxygen. Right. That's the only difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA is deoxy without oxygen. RNA has oxygen in it. Now, I, I don't care that you know anything about this molecule or its shape or anything like that. But what you need to remember is that on the three carbon is a hydroxyl group, right? And on this five carbon, you can't see it, but this sticks out. So on the five prime is a phosphate group that's attached here. And on the three prime is a hydroxyl group. This is gonna come in to be really important in chapter 16 and 17. Um, but for now, uh, that's all you need to know. All right, so you guys know that DNA is found in the nucleus of things that are have a nucleus. What do we call organisms with a nucleus? Eukaryote. And what do we call organisms without a nucleus? Prokaryote. Good. So in all eukaryotes, which are most organisms, these are only bacteria. The DNA is in the nucleus, right? There's only one copy of that. DNA isn't involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the cell. DNA just sits in there. It's a cookbook. <laughs> Your cookbook is not going to make you dinner. You need the ingredients in protein to actually make your cells. So proteins are what do the work uh, based on the instructions contained in the DNA. Uh, we pass exact copies of our DNA to each of the cells. So every cell in your body has the exact same DNA, exact same set of instructions. All right, so when we look at RNA, so central dogma of biology is that DNA is turned into RNA and RNA is turned into protein. And this is called the central dogma. This was coined by the guys that supposedly found the structure of DNA, which is James Watson and Francis Crick. Uh, they didn't really know what this meant, uh, so it's, it may not be actually fitting for what we're talking about, but it's ingrained into the language of biologists now, so we just use that term. But what it means is that DNA is the instruction book. That has to be made into RNA, which goes out of the nucleus into the harsh environment of the cell uh, because it's expendable. It's just a copy. And then that is made into protein. So when we're talking about uh, the COVID vaccine, so part of the, the Pfizer vaccine is an RNA vaccine. And then there's other vaccines that are protein vaccines. So the RNA vaccine uh, is the basically the middleman. That RNA has to get delivered to your cells. And then there's... Uh, things in there that turn it into protein that we'll talk about in chapter six. They're called ribosomes. You don't need to know that for test one, but you will need to know that for exam two. All right, so there's different types of this RNA. We have messenger RNA. This is what this is. So this is what we call mRNA or messenger RNA. And you might have seen that the that uh, COVID vaccine is an mRNA based vaccine. That means it carries the genetic code from the DNA, right? DNA to RNA. We have transfer RNA. Uh, that has a function that we're gonna talk about in chapter uh, 17. 
for now, I just all you need to know is that it its job is to bring the amino acids to the newly forming protein chain. So if we had threonine and we needed to bring in tryptophan, well, the the molecule that would bring tryptophan it's in the next to link it together with threonine would be the transfer RNA. So it's a carrier molecule. And that's all you need to know for right now. And then there's ribosomal RNA. And it is part of these ribosomes that help read the, the RNA in the right direction. Just like it, it tells it to read it from left to right instead of right to left. Right, because those would be two different words. And again, we'll cover this. We'll cover this a little bit in chapter six, and then in depth in chapter seventeen. But right now, just know the three different RNAs: mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. The T stands for transfer, R stands for ribosome. All right, so this is what we just talked about: DNA is in the nucleus for eukaryotes. It's made into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus. The ribosomes read it, kind of like a ticker tape, and they put the all the amino acids together in long chains. And then we talked about those. Those fold together based on the primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, uh, interactions. And then they end up with a specific shape. And that shape determines shape, I can spell the day, that determines its function. <clears throat> okay, so I don't want you to memorize this. What I want you to come out of this is that these are single rings. And if they're single rings, they're called pyrimidines. And if they're double rings, they're called purines. So what you need to know is that the purines are A's and G's. So you might have to just memorize that. And these are double rings. And the pyrimidines are C's and T's in DNA. And in, in RNA, T gets replaced with U. It's a close chemical cousin. In fact, these are identical except for this methyl group right here. All right, and so we talked about this has a phosphate group and that's negatively charged. And together, uh, the base, so this is the A, G, C, and T. The sugar, so remember this could be ribose or deoxyribose and the phosphate group make up what we call nucleotides. And so this is the phosphate, sugar, and base. This is a double ring base, so what would that be called? Pyrimidine or purine? That's a purine. This is a single ring base, so what is this called? Pyrimidine. And then I might ask you, what's a purine? Purines are A's and G's. Pyrimidines are C's and T's and U's. This is only an RNA. This is only in DNA. So that's what you need to take away from this. All right, a couple things. RNA is single stranded, so it's super unstable. You want it to be unstable because let's say that in your cell, you go outside and it's super cold and your DNA is gonna make RNA that makes a protein that makes you shiver. Right? It's because you're cold and your shivering makes your body temperature go up. Now, if this RNA sat around in your cytoplasm, what would happen when you went inside and it was real stable? What would happen when you went inside and you got warm? So the answer is you would continue to shiver. Until you get rid of this, it's going to continue to make the protein to make you shiver. 
So you want your RNA to be unstable and break down real easily. And that's why the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept so cold because mRNA is unstable. That's different, right? Then DNA, the DNA is super stable because it's a double helix. It's like a, think about it as a page in a book. So you go and you put the book outside, pay, the middle of the book, right? You open it up to the elements. That's gonna degrade right away. But if you close the book, chances are that that page is gonna stay around for a long time because it's protected by the other pages in the book. And because DNA is two strands instead of one, like RNA, so the, uh, double stranded, then it lasts longer. Um, they've even found DNA in a Tyrannosaurus Rex femur from 125 million years ago. So it's super stable. And you know you could use that to do Jurassic Park, but I'll save that for another lecture because we're kind of running out of time. What you should also know about this is that uh, between A's and T's, there are two hydrogen bonds. Uh, so which one of these is A and which one of these is T? Let's go back and take a look. So uh, T would T have a single ring or two rings? Single. So then we could we can deduce that this has got to be an A and T because it has two hydrogen bonds. So this would have to be the T, and this would have to be what? The A, right? Because A's are double rings. And then for this one, this has three hydrogen bonds. So I know one of these is a G and one of these is C. So which one is G and which one is C? What's this one? G. Yes, because G is double ring. And this one would be C because it's single ring. Any questions about that? One thing you should also notice is that this runs anti-parallel. So this is the number five carbon right here. And this right here is the number three carbon. So this goes three to five. And this one goes three to five in the opposite direction. So DNA runs five to three on one strand and three to five on the other strand. We call that anti-parallel. All right, any questions? Okay. So we can use variations in DNA to measure evolution. Remember, evolution doesn't mean we came from monkeys. It means that we change our DNA changes over time. And so, you know, when you go to, when you're looking at paternity test, who, what would you expect to be the baby's father? Someone that had really close DNA to the kid or distant DNA? Close. close, right? So you already know that if you have similar DNA, you're more closely related. And we could use that not only for paternity testing, but we can use that to compare humans to other humans like who's more closely related, uh, Asians or Caucasians or, uh, you know, Hispanics and or whatever, uh, various races. We can also compare humans to like chimpanzees or frogs based on the similarity and differences between DNA. So here's an example. If we looked at amino acids and hemoglobin, remember we have beta and alpha, so this is just the beta subunit. If we look at all humans, there's no difference. Remember I told you there's only one change in that sickle cell? So if we looked at all humans with normal hemoglobin, there'd be no variation. We'd all be the same. In gorillas versus humans, there's one change. In gibbons, there's two. Rhesus monkeys, there's eight. Mice, there's 27. And frogs, there's 67. So what do you think is most closely related to humans based on this data? Gorilla. 
gorillas and what's more distantly related to humans yeah. frogs. frogs and you'd be right and that's how they build these relationship trees right we have a common ancestor frogs uh, are more distantly related uh, humans are most closely related to gorillas and other primates uh, and so on so we can do this with your family tree this is how 23andme can figure out who's related to who you probably heard some crazy stories about you know they caught uh the uh my mind's drawn a blank the what was the it wasn't the was it the zodiac killer it, some some killer in california they found out who he was by looking at a database of 23andme and matching one of his relatives partially to the dna that they had from the crime scene and then they traced it back to find out who the killer was that you know committed this rape and murder like 50 years earlier um, so this is powerful technology you guys are probably familiar with that um, to to figure out relatedness um, based on dna evidence all right so that's all i got uh, that's the end of everything that you need to know for exam one. I know I told you guys I would do a review. Um, so uh, what I, I didn't get a chance to do that today, but what I will do is I'll set up a review session for tomorrow, um, same time, so 12.45 at uh, 2, 2. I don't have it. I don't think I have a department meeting, so I can do that. Um, and then I'll do a review. So if you guys are interested in reviewing, or if you have any questions about this stuff, uh, make sure you go through the each of the lectures. Uh, take notes. Use your notes to answer the questions in the crosswords and the powerpoints. Uh, I'm sorry. Then the study guides. And and make sure that you're taking your your uh your quizzes for each of these chapters as you go along because like i told you in the beginning you know i'm basically asking you to prepare to play a, a piano recital uh, which is basically the exam and if you wait to the day before to try to start learning how to play the piano when you get up in front of everyone, you're going to get stressed out. And this is what we call test anxiety. So make sure that you guys, if you're not doing that now for this test, that you do it for a future test, you follow along and stay up with the material because you're not going to be able to learn all this stuff three days before the test. So you guys bring your quiz questions, your study guides, questions, your crossword questions, or any other questions uh, for the exam tomorrow. Uh, and then I will set up that link. Uh, it'll be the same link. So I'll just join that way. And then uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow if you want to do the review. If not, the exam opens uh, Saturday, uh, one minute to midnight, I think. And then you have until Wednesday to complete it. Make sure that you take quiz one uh to make sure that your lockdown browser is working properly before you start the quit the exam because i can't help you if you've waited until nine at night to start the exam on wednesday and your lockdown browser doesn't work all right any questions before i jump over to office hours i have i have one question yep about the quizzes so there's three tries for the quizzes it's good right. to through the quiz is like a question bank. Um, say I, I break from between quiz two and taking quiz three. Is there a time limit on that? No, you have up until the due date of the exam to take the quizzes. So you could take them all the way up to Wednesday. Uh, you know, it has to be finished by 11.59 p.m. on, on Wednesday. So you would need at least 20 minutes to give yourself the time to take it. 
So you'd want it to log in about 20 minutes before midnight. Okay, so I can if you wanted to do that, but I would recommend doing it as soon as possible because I'm telling you guys that those quiz questions are going to be super similar to exam questions. In fact, they may be identical. That's the hint. I could take the a final, like leave the final quizzes, like say I took quiz one and two for all of them. And I could save the final quiz three as like a warm up, like a test. Sure, that'd be a good practice test for you. Just pacing myself. Yeah, that's good. And we're only doing quizzes one through five. I couldn't hear you. We're only doing quizzes one through five. Yeah, for right now, that's all it's due because that's all that's covered on the first exam. Remember, the quizzes are practice questions for the test. So, you know, I don't, when I was a college student, I didn't like not really knowing how the professor was going to formulate questions and same, things like that. So, the reason that I give you guys these quizzes is to get you used to the exam format. It's going to be the same, it's going to be multiple choice. It's going to be logical reasoning questions. Sometimes they'll be easy where you just have to say, you know, what do we call a, a, an organism that uh, has a nucleus, right? Or it might be a thought question. How do I make a 0.5 molar solution of glucose? So some questions are going to be more difficult than others, but they'll all be multiple choice. And I, 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 the quiz questions are meant to simulate exam questions. Any other questions? All right, so uh, you guys wanna to come to the review tomorrow, you can. Otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll pick up lecture on chapter six on Tuesday. And then uh, make sure you guys study for the test. It's uh, you have to have you have to complete it by Wednesday at one minute to midnight. So give yourself at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half to finish it. You won't need the you shouldn't need the whole time. Most students finish it in less than an hour. Um, it was the, all these tests were designed to give in my fifty minute uh, classes in person. So you should be able to finish this in less than an hour. But you still have two and a, two and a half hours to complete it. All right, good luck. And if I don't see you tomorrow, have a good weekend. Thank you. Welcome.